Section 1 A man wants to find out about a language course. Listen to the conversation between the man and the woman and answer the questions. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. You will see that there is an example which has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played twice. Good morning, University Language Centre. How can I help you? I'm interested in doing a language course. I did Mandarin last year, and now I'd like to do Japanese. The man says he would like to do a Japanese course, so the answer is C. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully, and answer questions 1 to 4. Good morning, University Language Centre. How can I help you? I'm interested in doing a language course. I did Mandarin last year, and now I'd like to do Japanese. Can you give me some information about what courses are available at your centre, and when they start, that sort of thing? Yes, certainly. Well, we actually offer a number of courses in Japanese at different levels. Are you looking for full-time or part-time? Oh, I couldn't manage full-time as I work every day, but evenings would be fine and certainly preferable to weekends. Well, we don't offer courses at the weekend anyway, but let me run through your options. We have a 12-week intensive course, three hours, three nights a week. That's our crash course. Or an eight-month course, two nights a week. I think the crash course would suit me best as I'll be leaving for Japan in six months' time. Are you a beginner? Not a complete beginner, no. Well, we offer the courses at three levels. Beginners, lower intermediate and upper intermediate, though we don't always run them all. It depends very much on demand. I'd probably be at the lower intermediate level, as I did some Japanese at school, but that was ages ago. Right. Well, the next Level 2 course begins on Monday the 12th of September. There are still some places on that one. Otherwise, you'd have to wait until January or March. No, I'd prefer the next course. The woman asks the man for some details about himself. Look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen to their conversation and complete the form. Right. Can I get some details from you then, so I can send you some information? Sure. What's your name? A family name first. Haggerty. Richard. H-A-G-A-R-T-Y? Uh, no. H-A-G-E-R-T-Y. Oh, OK. And your address, Richard? Well, perhaps you could email it to me. Right. What's your email address? It's ricky45, uh, that's one word, r-i-c-k-y-4-5, at hotmail.com. And I just need some other information for our statistics. 
This helps us offer the best possible courses and draw up a profile of our students. Fine. What's your date of birth? I was born on the twenty ninth of February, nineteen eighty. Nineteen eighty. So you're a leap year baby. That's unusual. Yes, it is. And just one or two other questions for our market research, if you don't mind. No, that's fine. What are your main reasons for studying Japanese? Business, travel, or general interest? My company is sending me to Japan for two years. All right, I'll put down business. And do you have any specific needs? Will there be an emphasis on written language? For instance, will you need to know how to write business letters, that sort of thing? No, but I will need to be able to communicate with people on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, so I'll put down conversation. Yes, because I already know something about the writing system at an elementary level, and I don't anticipate having to read too much. You said you'd studied some Japanese. Where did you study? Three years at school.、Uh, then I gave it up, so I've forgotten a fair bit. You know how it is with languages if you don't have the chance to use them. Yes, but I'm sure it will all come back to you once you get going again. Now, once we receive your enrolment form, we'll contact you. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section two. In this section, you'll hear a message left to John on how to look after the house. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to twenty. Now listen carefully to the message and answer questions eleven to twenty. Hello, John. Welcome to the house. I'm really pleased that you can be here to look after my house while I'm away. Here are some things you need to know about the house. Important stuff like when the garbage is collected. In fact, let's start with the garbage, which is collected on Friday. Just write garbage on the calendar on the days they take it away. Put it out on Friday every week. That'll be Friday the twenty-second, Friday twenty-ninth, and Friday the fifth. It's a really good service. The trucks are quiet and the service is efficient. The bin would be put outside of the house empty. It's a good idea to put it away quickly. This street can be quite windy. I once watched my next-door neighbor chase her bin the whole length of the street. Every time she nearly caught up with it, it got away again. The waste paper will be collected this Tuesday. That's Tuesday the nineteenth. There's a plastic box full of paper in the front room. Please put it out on Tuesday. The truck will come during the day. If you don't mind collecting old newspapers and other paper and putting them in the box, I'll put it out when I come home. The paper people only come monthly. I have some things to give to charity in a box in the front room. Would you put it out on Monday the twenty-fifth, please? It's a box of old clothes. And some bed linen, which I've collected, plus a few other bits and pieces. The charity truck will come by during the day on the last Monday of the month. Like the paper people, it comes monthly. If you want to use the library, you'll find it on Darling Street. I've left my borrower's card near the telephone. It has a very good local reference section if you want to find out more about this city. The library is open from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday to Saturday. I'm sorry to say that we don't have a cleaner. Oh yes, filters. Would you please change the filters on the washing machine on the last week of the month, no matter which day? We find that the machine works much better if we change the filters regularly. The gas company reads the meter on the thirtieth, the last Saturday. I think that's all the information about our calendar of events.
Well, John, I'm trying to think what else I should be telling you. As you know, I'm going to a conference in London. I hope to have a little time to look around. It's a great city. I do hope I manage to get at least some of the theatres and museums. I'm looking forward to all the things I have to do at the conference too. I'm giving a paper on Tuesday, the twenty-sixth, and there are a couple of exciting events planned later in the conference program. I hope to meet up with an old teacher of mine at the conference. She taught English literature at my high school, and we've kept in touch through letters over the years. She now teaches at the University of Durham, and I'm really looking forward to seeing her again. By the way, I expect you're hungry after your trip. I've left a meal in the refrigerator for you. I hope you like cheese and onion pie. Would you do me a favor, please? I haven't had time to cancel an appointment. It was made a long time ago, and I forgot about it until this morning. It's with my dentist for a checkup on Thursday, the twenty-eighth. Could you please call the dentist on eight one six two five two five and cancel the appointment for me? Thanks a lot, John. One last thing: when you leave the house, make sure the windows and doors are shut, and set the burglar alarm. The alarm code number is nine one two zero. Have fun! I'll see you when I get back. This is your friend Martha saying goodbye. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section three. Section three. You will hear a discussion between two students and their tutor. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Okay, guys. First off, well done. That was a very good presentation yesterday. Now I'm just going to ask you questions about it before I give you my feedback. That okay? Sure. Of course. Right. Well, in that case, tell me, Niall, why did you choose to talk about Rafael Nadal? To tell you the truth, I didn't. I think I. Better let Sheena handle this one, Sheena. Yes, it was my decision to pick Nadal. Now that might be a strange choice for a presentation entitled "Someone Who Inspired Me to Study Psychology," but yes, but I was going to say it does seem rather an odd choice. Was it simply down to the fact that he's a sporting hero of yours and so a role model? You talk about him a lot, Sheena. So this much is clear. It's true. Nadal is someone I look up to, but my reasons for choosing him were totally professional. You see, I doubt, perhaps in the history of tennis, that there was ever a better match player than him, and that got me thinking: what is the secret to his success? How does he control his nerves so splendidly? The more we started to look into his background, the more I realised Sheena was right. Nadal was a perfect candidate for this study. He is, on so many levels, a very well balanced character, and it was fascinating to gain an insight into the mind of this great champion over the last few weeks. I'll admit that I was at first somewhat unsure about whether or not I should back Sheena on this one, but it didn't take long for our research to put us at ease. So, while most of the students were researching Freud and other visionaries in the field of psychology and psychoanalysis. You were looking into a present-day sports star. Does that not strike you as a little odd? Of course, we knew it was a risk. After all, there was a danger that no one, least of all you, would take us seriously. 
when we stood up on stage and started our presentation. That said, I think it is in the spirit of psychology to be inquisitive and adventurous and not just stick to the conventional. Otherwise, how would the field have come so far, as it has done already? Well, I must say, your risk certainly paid off. Yours was, without a shadow of a doubt, the most interesting and original presentation I saw. And judging by the reactions of the other students, I would have to say that everyone else was equally impressed. Thank you. I'm so glad you think so. Yes, but notwithstanding your excellent presentation content, we must remember that the marks for this project are awarded based on a number of criteria, and we'll examine those in a few minutes. But first, another question. Where did you find your sources? Well, and I don't quite know how we managed it, but we were able to secure a face-to-face -face interview with Nadal while he was over here for the Wimbledon Tennis Championship, so we won't rely on newspaper articles and interviews or any other forms of secondary sources. We did, however, find the library sports archive an invaluable backup aid to help us fill in the gaps and piece together our interpretation of what makes Nadal such a mentally strong champion. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. OK. Well, as I said, congratulations again for your excellent work. Now it's time for my feedback. The first area where marks were awarded is in your use of equipment. I felt that had you not been a little too reliant on the overhead projector, and had you, for example, used the interactive whiteboard and audio equipment a little more effectively, you would have received top marks in this section. As things stand, though, your use of equipment was still very satisfactory. It's just a shame as it was an opportunity missed to score full points. The next area I was asked to assess is content. As you might have guessed, I simply can't fault you on that. Highly original work, so well done. As for your timing, I felt that the two of you were a little too over-rehearsed, so the presentation felt, at times, a little robotic. That said, again, it was very satisfactory, and you would get full points for effort. Sadly, though, there is such a thing as trying too hard, and that cost you top marks here, I'm afraid. Oh, I see. Right. What was particularly impressive, though, was the thick handout you'd prepared for everyone. I took it home to read through it afterwards, and it was very well written. But not alone that, it also enhanced my experience of the presentation itself on the day, as I was able to refer to the handout for further information on what was being discussed and to answer any questions I had. Very nice. As for your level of interaction... Well, you had so much that you were intent on packing into your 20-minute time slot that, sadly, you ran out of time at the end, which left no room whatsoever for interaction and no one had the chance to ask you any questions. You've probably guessed, therefore, that you did worse than average in this department and, unfortunately, your score will have to reflect this. Oh, my goodness. Everything sounded so positive at the start. That is a big disappointment. We work so hard. Now, now, don't be so quick to get deflated. Remember, your presentation skills only count for 15% of the project grade. Your score in this assessment, even if it were terrible, would still not be enough to prevent you from getting top marks overall. It's very hard to score well in the presentation assessment anyway, so believe me, you both did reasonably well. Thank you. I wish I felt like that. Yes, your feedback was very constructive. We're just a little disappointed with ourselves. Why? That's the end of section three. You have half a minute 
to check your answers. Now turn to section four. Section four. You will hear part of a lecture about the early history of cinema. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen to the lecture, and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Now we all take the wonders of the cinema very much for granted these days, but cinema really is a very recent phenomenon. It has moved from its origins in the simple still camera to the dazzling computer-generated graphics of today in little over a hundred years. Perhaps the real beginning of cinema. Was the cinematograph, a moving camera invented by the Lumiere brothers? As the excitement at the early screenings of short, simple moving pictures spread, competition developed rapidly, and soon cameras such as the American Biograph were on the market. Advertisements asserted that the Biograph did not shake as much as the cinematograph. Meanwhile, permits were acquired for outside filming. And import licenses were difficult to obtain for equipment, and there were other difficulties for cameramen. When the Lumiere brothers went to film the crowning of Tsar Nicholas II in Russia in 1896, the camera's ticking noise led people to believe it was a bomb. Although this confusion was resolved, disaster struck at the ceremony when a stand of spectators collapsed and the huge crowd panicked. The cameramen kept filming. It was the first time such events had been filmed, and this marked the beginning of a new concept of journalism. Well, the technology continued to develop rapidly, and often secretly. The thrill of invention and the prospect of riches to be made drove experimenters along, but historians of cinema face difficulties in establishing if an apparatus functioned in the way that its makers asserted. Everyone was keen to say that their machine was the best. Of course, in some cases, however, we do have reliable records or evidence in the equipment itself, and then we can see the details of the evolution of the technology. By about 1890, for example, the Frenchman Marais had arrived at results of startling clarity in sequential images. He also had the idea of recording images on a long strip of paper that unrolled in front of the lens instead of on separate plates, but he found it impossible initially to ensure that this strip would have regular movement. As we step into the twentieth century, however, we see much progress has been made, and there are many examples of what we would today recognize as films. Questions of the art form were now as important as questions of what was technologically possible, and filmmakers searched around for ideas to draw on. Comic strips were very popular at the time in newspapers, and their structure was applied to the planning of films, which were now being mapped in a series of picture panels. Different innovations were achieved by different types of filmmaker, with a certain amount of rivalry between makers of documentaries and makers of fiction films. One area where documentaries led the way was in the use of travelling shots, although of course fiction films adopted this technique in due course. Various sources for stories were developing, and each would have an impact on the way the story was filmed. 
For example, filmmakers started to use greater numbers of shots when chase films became popular, because they wanted to show the various stages of the policeman running after the bandit and so on. And it wasn't just different kinds of story that were driving filmmakers to think up new techniques. Other technology also played its part. The telephone was growing in use, and filmmakers came up with the idea of splitting the screen image into two parts to show telephone conversations. All this growing sophistication in the shooting of films began to make the whole process of creating them more challenging. The very first films consisted of single shots and were straightforward to take from shooting to showing them to audiences. However, as the filming developed into multiple shots, then editing emerged as an essential ingredient of the process. Cinema was growing up. Well, next I'd like to turn your attention to some of the issues that I believe were. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.